Hello and welcome into the KE Report. I'm your host, Shad Markwitz, and today we are getting an update on Goliath Resources. Goliath is traded on the TSXV under the ticker GOT and on the OTCQB under the ticker GOTRF. And I'm joined today with the CEO of Goliath Resources, Roger Rosmus, and also a PhD student from the Colorado School of Mines, Randall Karcher. And that'll be important as we dig into today's discussion, which really focuses on the news that you put out to the marketplace on April the 24th, confirming what we had a hunch of, and that is that the gold digger property and what you're seeing at the the Surebet Discovery is really a reduced intrusion related gold system. And so that's the source of this mineralization that's coming up. And you've got kind of two flavors of it here. You've got a number of these stacked veins that we've talked about a lot in the past, Roger. And you also have some of these dikes that we've looked at that have that different mineralization. You see in it a lot of the bismuth and tellurium and molybdenite. So it gave you some early indicators that those were pathfinder minerals for a reduced intrusion system. I guess just to kick us off, Roger, what would you say big picture for people listening in? Why is this significant, not just for the company, but really for the Golden Triangle? Number one, hey, Shad, thanks for having us. It really, it's, it's a kind of a two prior here. I mean, the bottom line is this thing is, looks to be much, much bigger potentially than we had originally thought. Certainly, you know, with this reduced intrusive related gold bearing dikes that we're seeing cross, you know, crossing through our, our shear zones that we've been chasing. And then again, secondly, this is the first time ever that this young Eocene, basically young rock has been documented in the Golden Triangle. So bottom line is a lot of uh, heads are turning and eyebrows are lifting going like, holy smokes, we need to go back and look at some of our Eocene intrusive related type of uh, looking uh, rocks in the triangle. So it's uh, it's some pretty good science uh, that we're doing here. Obviously, we're, we're sponsoring a number of students there at Colorado School of Mines, one being uh, Randall there with his PhD. You know, we need to keep on bringing in new people into the sector, uh, giving them the, the ability and I guess just the opportunity really to, to get involved in the sector because, you know, we need to replace uh, all of us old guys getting closer and closer to retirement. Yeah, it's a nice initiative to sponsor some of the students, especially the PhD and master students at the Colorado School of Mines. And on that note, Randall, let's bring into the discussion here. As far as the science behind this, just from a high level, when we say that this is a reduced intrusion-related gold system, for people that are not geologists and are wondering why is that important, I think some of that ties into the potential size and scale of this kind of deposit. But walk us through some of the high-level findings that you found when you dove into the data here at the Gold Digger property. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having us on. Um, so as part of my master's and now PhD research at the Colorado School of Mines, I've been taking a deep look at the mineralization at Sherbet, doing things like dating it, finding out how old it is, looking at the minerals present in thin sections, doing geochemistry. And what we find is that the mineralization in the veins as well as in the dikes are consistent with what we'd call a reduced intrusion-related gold system. So that is to say a system that's brought in by a large intrusive body. So you can think of the veins at Shorebet sort of like smoke coming out of a campfire, you know, and then the intrusion itself is the fire. So it's the engine that brings in the gold. It came out of a magma chamber. Now, the significance of understanding that versus it being, say, a different kind of gold system is that there are unique vectors that you can use to go towards a causative intrusion, uh, the actual system that brought in the gold. And in the case of somewhere like Snowline or Fort Knox, these are reduced intrusion related systems where actually the gold is present in very large quantities inside of the intrusion itself. Now, at Sherbet, most of what we're finding so far has been in the veins, but now that we're able to vector towards and uh, understand the system better, uh, we're actually going to be able to target the intrusive units which have been systematically ignored in the Golden Triangle. In fact, it's been common wisdom or at least supposed wisdom, for a while that the Eocene is not favorable. Uh, so the young rocks are unfavorable for gold. But now we know better. Uh, we know that 
gold digger is an Eocene system and related to a suite of Eocene intrusions that we now find gold in. So the, the implications are there's a lot more gold to be found in rocks where people simply have not been looking. Well, it is exciting science, guys, just to be flipping the script on what was thought to be settled science. And now the beauty of science is you're always testing it and you come up with new data. You have a new interpretation. Another thing that we've noted the whole time we've been looking at the drill results really for years is the amount of visible gold in it. So maybe I'll throw this over to you again, Randall, as far as, you know, I know that it's very fine up to coarse grain visible gold, but there's a lot of it. Most of the drill assays came back with visible gold. Is that a symptom of these kind of systems? Or what can you say about the, just the sheer amount of visible gold you can see when you drill into this rock package? Well, that just speaks to the gold-rich nature of the fluids that brought in uh, the mineralization. So um, there are some systems that are uh, low-grade, high tonnage, where there's not much gold that you can see, but there's a, a lot of it. And of course, this is a high-grade situation where, I mean, if you're seeing visible gold, that tells you something about the system, right? And that's being reflected in our assays. I mean, we are intersecting visible gold all over the place, and that's reflected in the grade that's coming back. And it's just, it speaks to how gold-rich the system is and how much gold had to actually come out of the causative intrusion uh, in order to obviously make that much visible gold. Well, and we've talked about the Pathfinder elements in here being the bismuth, the molybdenite, also the tellurium. So what is the importance of those as far as future exploration work that the company will do as far as, uh, does that let you know you're on the right track? And how important are those to appear in nature with the gold? So you can think of these geochemical pathfinders like arrows that point you towards a heat source, a fluid source. So in an intrusion-related system, like we have here, you expect to concentrate zinc and lead uh, in the form of typically galena and sphalerite away from a causative intrusion. And that's exactly what we see at Sherbet, by the way. But inside of a causative or towards a causative intrusion, you would expect an enrichment of bismuth and tellurium and molybdenite, which is also exactly what we see. So the significance of that is it's telling you something about a gradient. It might be a geochemical gradient or a heat gradient, but you can effectively trace it back to what caused the mineralization. And the fact that we're finding concentrations of bismuth, tellurium, all associated with gold inside of these intrusive dikes which also happened to be coincident age from our geochronology, that suggests that these dikes are actually part of the causative system because they're the same age and they have all the hallmarks of what you'd expect to be the causative intrusion. So where these dikes connect to, where there's a larger body, that is something that we can explore in the future using these Pathfinder geochemical signatures. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about finding the body from all these different fingers. Uh, we've looked at some images that the companies put out on the different cartoons as far as what it looks like. It looks like a giant kraken at the bottom with these tentacles coming up or some kind of a squid or something. Obviously, there's going to be a bigger body where all these different dikes run off of it. Is that generally understood to be at depth? Is the, the prognosis to drill deeper or can it be something where it's over to the side? Give us a little more color around where the body of this could be. Sure. So at depth is a possibility, but it's also completely possible that it's to the south, to the north, or even to the west. In fact, there's a massive Eocene pluton to the west, uh, a very big intrusive body called the hydropluton, which is Eocene in age as well. Now that's been ignored largely by all explorers in the region. So it's on our claim block, so that's somewhere we can look as well, but it doesn't necessarily have to be at depth. And since these Eocene intrusions have been overlooked for so long. Honestly, we got to look up, down, and all around. But one thing's for sure, there's going to be the intrusion that brought in the gold, and that would be a good thing to find. Well, and Roger, I want to bring you back in the discussion here just to talk about the relogging program that you did, because initially you guys weren't looking at these rock packages either. So now that you've logged a lot of it, maybe tell us about how that factored into just better understanding of uh, the system that you have in place and not just the veins, but also some of these dikes. Sure. Great. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to make a comment on that, on that uh, hider uh, again, up until last year, uh, you know, we had no idea what these things, you know, the, these dykes or this reduced intrusive style of mineralization was going to run. So 
and I'm not going to uh, steal uh, Randall's thunder here, but he, he was a he was a chap that actually went and relogged. He's the one that picked the the 13 holes from 2021 to 2023 to be relogged. Of those 13, uh, actually six of them had you know nice big chunks of visible gold and molly, etc. So what's been happening now is uh, over the off season. Now we know that, that this type of mineralization or this uh, type of rock is actually running some pretty high grade gold, of which you know that was a uh, it was drilled in 2022. Those hole number 58 uh, that was that ran uh, like 12 and a, just over 12 grams per ton gold equivalent over 10 meters. Now that's pretty significant. And then we had another one that was uh, 10 10 grams gold equivalent over 10 meters. I mean, so these are, you know, sizable grades and sizable widths when you, you know, certainly when you consider, you know, some of these other reduced intrusive style uh, deposits out there kind of running, you know, one, maybe two grams type of thing. So super excited about that. So right now, so we have confirmed four of these dikes are mineralized and we have another 13 to test this year. With that, we've identified in the off season, uh, I think there's about 44 holes in total that have this similar style of looking rock in the core, which will be kind of, you know, our first order of business uh, when we get to uh, the site this year, once we get the uh, the program kicked off for 2025. Well, and Randall, we'll bring you back in here. Since you picked the drill holes that were going to be re-logged, other than the, the rock type, was there anything else that stood out to you while you picked those? And then did you see other potential candidates that you could test in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, effectively, we had known going in that this was an intrusion-related system uh, into last season, but uh, which intrusion and what that might look like was sort of evading us. But it was when we had a large intercept of this dike sitting out on the table, one of our junior geos actually pointed out some veining, which then started uh, in motion uh, the realization, oh, wait, these things are actually veins. So uh, we looked at that. There was uh, bismuth, bismuth tellurides and gold in there. So off the backs of that, I simply uh, I took all the core logging photos we'd ever taken, uh, browsed through all the dikes, and picked the most prospective ones. Uh, I picked 13 in total, uh, which I relogged. And yeah, that's what came back with the gold grades, just simply looking for alteration and veining, which is very subtle uh, in the vein, uh, in the dikes. Elsewhere in Sherbet, uh, in the sedimentary and volcanic rocks, it's very, very altered and incredibly veined, uh, loaded with massive sulfide. But that's not the case in these dikes, which is why they were overlooked, because it's only very mildly altered and veined. But knowing that that mild alteration and veining was enough to bring in significant gold, uh, that's what caused us to look back on what we did. And that was only a very small sample of the actual dike intercepts that we've had. I only picked the absolute most prospective to see if they all ran, and many of them did. So there's a lot left on the table from previous seasons, and of course now we can actually target these intentionally rather than hitting them as a coincidence. And Randall, while you're there, maybe talk about the uh, just the study on the gold temperatures, the Goldilocks and the veins and uh, the reduced intrusive. Yeah, gladly. So what you're saying is based on what our, we found in our study where the actual gold inside of these dikes is a earlier, higher temperature assemblage than the gold found elsewhere in Sherbet and its veins. So... In most of Sherbet, we're finding a late cooler gold, so it's something that comes after the sulfide, uh, and it is associated often with chloride. In these dikes, we're actually finding a different association with gold. We're actually finding that they were largely transported as molten droplets, which is different. Not only molten droplets, but uh, molten droplets of gold uh, with bismuth and tellurium. And we're finding significant concentrations of gold transported in this way. So those are two distinct ways uh, and temperatures that the gold was moved in this system. We're also finding some intercepts where uh, you have both styles of gold. So we have the early hot gold and then the late cool gold. Uh, we've been calling these the Goldilocks zones because it's hot enough that we get the early gold and cool enough we get the late gold. So it's just right. And in these zones, it seems that is where we're finding especially high grades. Yeah, so the porridge is just right there. And hey, who doesn't like molten droplets of gold? So 
thank you for sharing that with us, Randall. And Roger, I guess with all of this that you've learned in this program, people listening in are probably chomping at the bit to find out, okay, so what are some of the targets going to be as far as follow-up for the next season? And also importantly, hey, Roger, when does this season start? So give us some color yeah. around, I know that it's still frozen and you got to go through breakup, but when do you think you could get on the ground and what will some of the key targets be for this year? Well, what, tomorrow's May 1st, so soon. Actually, the, the winter this year wasn't so, so bad as far as snowfall. And so we should be mobilizing fairly quickly. And the, uh, you know, to your question about, you know, what the target's going to be, obviously, we're going to continue to expand the knowledge base on all of these dikes. Again, we've got another 13 to follow up on to see whether or not they are gold bearing. And um, we'll be part of the, obviously, the drill program this year. We won't be avoiding them anymore. We'll certainly just be uh, sending our drills directly into it. And then, you know, we have piercing those and then into our, you know, our, our shear zones that, we are, that we've been talking about from the get-go here. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're super excited to get going here. You know, we've got some working on a few things. So, uh, you know, stay tuned. From a drilling perspective, you know, we've got adequate cash, uh, liquid securities, like a uh, financial statement as of December 31st, 2024, we had about 19.6 million. Uh, again, cash, liquid securities, and then plus another 3.2 million of additional cash came in since January of 2025 warrants and then we get another sort of four and a half to five million of other additional warrants in the money uh they all expire uh this year so you know we're we're certainly well capitalized to kick off a fairly aggressive drill program out of the gate yeah it'd be nice to see some of that warrant money come in and just keep feeding the treasury now the last couple of years we've had the same discussion roger we're going to start with a certain amount of meters and every year you've biggie sized it is that the plan again for 2025 yeah again you know we've got um I have to work within our financial range here. Uh, you know, we don't blow up the company, but as some folks may recall, or may you may recall as well, I mean, we came into the season with four million in the treasury. I ended up raising money in September, right? At uh, it was like uh, I forget, it was like a dollar twenty-five or dollar forty-five, what have you. And I think Rob McEwen came in and so on. But uh, so you know, clearly coming in with twenty million plus all these other warrants, you know, we're in a really solid position to increase the program as as we see it just one other question for you guys especially while we got randall here last year you had teased a reduced intrusion discovery i think it was from a channel sample a rock chip sample over at a target called blue origin is there still any interest in that as far as being a reduced intrusion type of mineralization anything you want to say on that particular target sure uh so blue origin has a lot of hallmarks that indicate that it was a part of the pluton where it exalted fluids so it's got aplite dikes and lots of veins there's sulfides and there are gold bearing grab samples that were taken in previous years as well the veins present there are also associated with molybdenite bismuth and bismuth tellurides just like the gold bearing dikes at sherbet so this is enough smoke that i would love to go back and take another look and see if we can find some gold signatures out there it would definitely be worth a look because it is the same age as Sherbet and it's got all the signatures of a intrusion that let off a bunch of fluid. Yeah, and that's uh, shot. That's what the reason we increased our uh, property. We just grabbed everything to the south once we found out about this uh, the Eocene granodiorite bearing gold. Uh, I guess the land package, I think it was like about 28%. But just everything was wide open because everyone's just thinking, okay, yeah, it's, it's uh, barren of any economical minerals or gold and uh, so it was available and you know now we're sitting just over 91,000 hectares in size. All right guys well I think we'll wrap it up there for today. This was just great to get you on and learn a little bit more about the geology, learn a little bit more about the whole system, what's bringing the fluids in, what's bringing in the gold and even the uh, molten droplets of gold into the gold digger property particularly at the Sherbet Discovery. A couple other interesting targets that the team has to go after this year well capitalized to go after the drilling for this year and a lot of momentum after a lot of key strategic stakeholders got positioned in the company over the last two years. So a lot of news that's going to be on tap for Goliath Resources in the year to come. For those listening in, definitely click on the link in the show notes. It takes you over to the Goliath Resources website straight to their news section where you can follow along or sign up for updates. Roger, Randall, great to have you on the call. And as always, looking forward to our next conversation.
Thanks, Sean. Anytime. Look forward to the next update. Thank you so much.